Um, hello. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to the second of the uh, two sessions that I'm doing here in the fall at the Salt Marsh. Those, are, those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, so everybody gets to do what they like. And I really like doing this because my clients think I'm young. So that's it's terrific for me. So um, as, as for folks who had been here for the first session this fall, you know, what I was trying to do this fall um, is to not just talk about law, but really to talk about my friends Frank and Mary at various ages, and to talk about the different issues they want to be, they need to be facing at those ages, and who they should be talking to about those issues. So last presentation, I talked about Frank and Mary at 70, and then Frank and Mary at 80, um, and and because your your issue, your situation changes, you know, you're 70 and you're retired and you're both feeling great, you know, and it's kind of a, how do you deal with that, and then you're 80. And you're not feeling quite as great, but you're still okay, you know, and you're handling it around the house. So uh, this time Mary is 90 uh, and she's feeling not terrific. And she's especially not terrific because Frank's dead. In this case, we're just dealing with Mary and we're talking about Mary during the rest of her life. Um, Frank and Mary, when we talked about them at 70, their life expectancy was each around 15 years. And when we talked about them at 80, their life expectancy was around somewhere between uh, um, uh, eight and nine years. So at 90, uh, Mary's life, at, at 90, Frank's dead, so he's got no life expectancy. At 90, Mary's actuarial life expectancy is a little under five years, which is certainly not nothing, but it's not 90 years, right? Because once again, 90 years have already gone by now for Mary. And, and what, what I, was I always talk to my clients about, you know, the focus of your life always has to be on where you're going, not where you've been, because where you've been is where you've been, and that's not gonna change. So the question is, how can Mary um, make those years as good as possible? So if Mary is here living on Nantucket, she has a very modest home that's only worth $800,000. Um, she has her savings account, um, because in this case, Frank and Mary have the, Mary has the same assets that Frank and Mary had had. They've been able, she's been able to sustain herself, so she's got some resources. She doesn't have great income. This is really common here, right? That you've got folks with pretty social security or other, other, you know, they're kind of regular source of income other than earnings or in the investments, typically not that high. She's 2,000 a month, but she's okay. But the real question for Mary, she wants, like for, with Frank before, she wants to live in her house until she dies. She wants to be buried in the backyard. She wants to not run out of money before she dies. That, that'd be really bad. She wants to leave to the rest of her kids to her kids and she wants to sleep well at night. So how does she manage to do that? Now, if Mary is coming into me for the first time, I'm just gonna to talk to you in, in terms of the, her, her legal issues, this is what I'm gonna be talking to her, her about, right? Are there any assets that are just in Mary's name? Because if they're just in Mary's name and she dies, they're gonna to have to go through the probate process, so maybe she wants to structure things in order to avoid that. Because now she's 90, so she's legitimately thinking, you know, I've lived a good life, I could go any time, so she wanted, kind of wants to be ready for that. Um, are they in trust? Typically the first question that people will ask me when they come in, if their assets aren't already in some kind of trust, is shouldn't the assets be in trust? And my, my answer to that is always another question. Well, what are you trying to accomplish? If your goal is to avoid, uh, ideally allow your kids to avoid probate after you die, then Maybe you want a trust that says that so, that, so that when you die, the assets are gonna be in trust and won't have to go through probate. If you're Mary and you're 90 and you haven't done any, any planning about this yet, and you're concerned that maybe at some point you're gonna to have to spend quite a bit of time in a nursing home, then maybe you want a very different kind of trust. Maybe you want a trust that you're conveying assets to where you're not the trustee and you're not in control and probably one of your kids is because if you convey it into that trust five years after you've conveyed it into trust, the assets that are in there are no longer countable or lienable. Um, so, so whether you want to trust, it, it, that's not an automatic. It, it's really just an answer to a question. It, uh, often uh, fo folks will come in to me who've got one child and they'll say, well, do I want to protect my assets. Shouldn't they, they be in trust? And I'll say, well, where do you want the assets to go? And they, they'll say, well, I want it to go to my child. And I said, well, then why don't you just give the assets to your child now? They'll say, oh my God, I can't do that. There's gonna be a, a gift tax. Well, actually, then I tell them, no, there isn't actually. There is no 
gift tax that affects you unless you have total assets of more than $11 million, which most people, even here, that's not what they have. Um, so you can just give it to them. And then in the case of the house, what I'll typically say is give your kids a remainder interest in the house. That is the interest in the house that kicks in when you die and keep a life estate so that you're in control while you're alive. But the moment of your death, your interest evaporates, your, kid, your child becomes the owner of the house, and you avoid the expense of having to create an irrevocable trust. So the point is there, there, are, there are some things that you'd want to talk to for me as a lawyer, but what you're, what you're concerned about more broadly is you've got this remaining time, right? So if your life expectancy is five years, whatever your life expectancy is, chances are there's going to be a period of that, the end, that's not going to be terrific, right? I mean, maybe you'll be one of those rare lucky ones who drops dead, but that's incredibly rare now, incredibly rare. I mentioned at the last seminar, in, in, in 1970, if you had a stroke or a heart attack, I saw this statistic that said, now Dr. Lepre's here, so. And by the way, of course, I have these wonderful guests today, Dr. Tim Lepre, whom everybody, I never have to introduce him because everybody knows, nobody knows me, everybody knows Dr. Dr. Lepre, and, and Aaron Kopecky, uh, who is your, the, the, person, the one person here who is actually developing a practice as a geriatric care manager, and I'm asking both of them to comment on this. So, so for, for Mary, her goal is to make as much of her remaining life, however much there is in that green part, and to try to minimize the red part. You try to minimize the, the point where you're really not feeling great, and she's, she's trying to figure that out. So she wants to be as healthy as she can be. She wants to be ready to, in, for when she's sick. Uh, to be sick, and then she wants to be ready in case she dies. Now, there's a wonderful book, and I'm going to show it to you before we leave because I'm strongly recommending this book. And I don't know, probably Dr. Lepre is, I don't know, but there's this wonderful book written this year, or published this year, called The Art of Dying Well. And, and it divides the, 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 and it's really the art of living well until you die. So it divides its things into chapters depending on how you're doing. And, and as far as I'm concerned, when I'm married, I'm kind of looking at chapter three. It, chapter three, each chapter starts off with a section that says, you should probably be interested in this chapter if any of this kind of relates to you. So this is kind of Mary. So you, you know that you're not gonna get like better, you know, you're not gonna feel better than you are, that the people who you've helped for many years, some of them are now kind of maybe helping you, that maybe you're using hearing aids, you're using a cane, you're using a walker, um, you need help with some of the chores, you know, making dinner, doing the housework, going out. Um, your health conditions, well, they used to be a hassle, now they really bother you, right? Um, and you sometimes worry that the people who are helping you, you're making them really tired, <laughs> you're wearing everybody else out. So that's kind of where you are when you're married. So I want to start off by asking Erin um, Kopecky to talk about what she as a geriatric care manager would be talking to Mary about at this point. And then I'd like to talk to, Do I'd like Dr. Lepre to talk about Mary. And because chances are, if, he, if she, she's been to Dr. Lepre, she's been with him for like 50 years, you know, so he's lived with her through her whole life. And now they're talking about her at her current stage of life. So Erin. Thank you. Hello everyone. So for those who don't know me, my name is Erin Kopecky and I started Tucked in Elder Care about a year and a half ago. I had the pleasure of speaking last month with Arthur and I spoke more towards positive aging and proactive aging. Um, so today I will speak more towards Mary at 90. So before I get started, I'm not going to get into too much detail about exactly what I do since I provided that last month. Um, but for a care manager, it's usually somebody who has expertise in the field of aging. For myself, I have the background of gerontology, so I'm a gerontologist. I have my license in nursing home administration, and I'm also a certified care manager, which allows me to do the work I do. So as a care manager, my main goal the minute I meet with a new client and provide an assessment is to ask what their goals are. Um, we all know that we all have goals, and those goals may change or remain the same. For Mary, from 70 and 80 to 90, some of her goals will most likely stay the same. Age in place, remain independent, stay as healthy as possible. And that's great and we can still achieve those goals, but we definitely need to put in, we definitely need to implement some recommendations and get her some services to achieve that goal. 
For instance, aging in place, that's probably the number one goal most of my clients have. They wanna remain in their home, they don't wanna to go to an assisted living community or a skilled nursing facility. So in order to allow that to happen, I provide my recommendations and I use my networks to get the services that they need, whether that be assistance with activities of daily living, such as bathing, dressing, and toileting, um, or perhaps um, as simple as um, assistance with instrumental activities of daily living, which is more focused on the meal preparation, the transportation to appointments, uh, grocery shopping, laundry, and housekeeping. Um, I also, as a care manager, provide safety and home uh, environmental wellness checks. Um, and I can also provide recommendations when it comes to home modifications. Some of my clients were able to ambulate very well in their home and now walking up and down the stairs isn't the safest for them. So as a care manager, I can help them get the services in place and the home modifications in place, whether that be a stair chair lift or if they have the ability to move their bedroom downstairs and redesign the first floor so it's livable for them. Um, and of course, like Arthur had mentioned, a lot of clients don't want to exhaust their family members and they don't want to uh, feel burdensome. So working with a care manager, I take on that stress and reduce that stress for the sandwich generation. There are a lot of individuals taking care of their parents, but they're also taking care of their children. And it, it can become very overwhelming. One of my main goals as a care manager is to make sure that my client and their loved ones maintain that child-parent relationship, um, which is so often lost sometimes. So that's another way that a care manager uh, helps not only the client, but also the family members involved as well. And lastly, I of course advocate and educate um, both the client and family. If a client ends up going to the doctors and they were recently diagnosed with dementia, I can help the client and family understand the disease progression and allow for the family to understand how to best interact with their loved one now that they're living with this disease. Thank you. So the main, the main and, and by the way, I, I appreciate very much the fact that Nantucket Cable um, tapes these and, and plays them. Um, because a lot of the folks who aren't here today are here because they're married and they're at home and they couldn't get there. Or they're taking care of somebody who is at home. But I think the importance of a person like a geriatric care manager is you want somebody who kind of, A, knows who all the players out there, who all the caregivers are, are out there, who what the agencies are, and, all, and, and, and can make some recommendations about who might be really better. I mean, I know in the, my hometown, there are larger areas, so there are several you know, care agencies, you know, and, and on a scale of one to 10, some are like eights or nines and some are fives. There are no ones or twos, fortunately, but the point is, I want somebody who's gonna know who the nines or tens are and who they can suggest to you. And they're gonna have that variety of, no, of knowledge just because they've gone through this with a bunch of other people. So how could you fix up your house? How could you make it safer? Well, you want somebody who either knows the person who is used to doing that kind of work or you've, who has seen enough of these examples so they can say, well, you know, this I've seen this before. So that's kind of like the goal of the geriatric care manager. It's really important. Sherry Hunt, um, who, once again, like Dr. Lepre, everybody seems to know, has had, she has a family member who's having some medical problems. So she couldn't make it last month. And I spoke to her at the senior fair last week, um, and she said that she couldn't make it to, today. So I just want to kind of emphasize that, as far, that, that that's another one of the players you'd always want to talk to. You want to call Sherry from, from, from Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands, because there are, the K Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands, once again, it's a, it's a, it's a nonprofit, um, there, are, there are one of 25 in Massachusetts. The, the state is divided into these nonprofits, um, and each one has a region, and they are the funnel through which all federal and state money go. So if you're trying to qualify for mass health, if you're trying to get just care in the home, and there's state-funded programs for, that provide care in the home up to eight to 10 hours a week, which is certainly not 24 seven, but it, for folks like Mary who just need a little help, it's often, a, it's the difference between being able to stay home safely and not. So you really wanna, you really wanna talk to Sherry. Now I, I've asked Dr. Lepre to talk about this because once again, he and, and, the, and the, the handful of other primary care physicians that you have on the island, among them have been dealing with the folks here like forever and, and therefore can give Mary the best insight 
into what she should be looking at, looking towards, because they probably have the best sense of who Mary is and kind of how Mary has, has progressed. So I'd asked Dr. Lepre to come and he was kind enough to make it here and I really appreciate it. Okay, thank so, you. So your observations, Doc. Okay, <clears throat> well I'll start off with, I have some of a dual role. I'm not only physician to some of you, I'm also the medical examiner. Uh, now that may <laughs> seem an odd combination, uh, but I get to see an awful lot of things uh, that patients have to deal with. You know, I think all of us knew Peter McKay, and uh, Peter was an excellent resource. You know, whenever I hit a stone wall uh, with any of the social services, or whenever I needed somebody uh, who could knew his way through it, I always called Peter. Now we know you're here, and so. Uh, You'll be getting phone calls. I think it's important. The person in the, new person in the hospital is also very good. Well, but, but not knowledgeable. Just uh, she's not Peter. Okay, she's not Peter. <laughs> uh, well, Peter's wife works for me also. So, uh, I think it's important for patients to understand their illness or what their spouse's illness is, and sort of have an idea how these things play out. And that that's not something that's a five-minute conversation or a 15-minute conversation. I think uh, it requires sitting down and talking to the patient, talking to the patient's spouse, uh, talking to the patient's family, so that everybody is, understands where Mary is on this continuum. Now, if Mary is in the green, then it's pretty easy. It's when Mary starts getting in, I forget, what was the color, red? We're talking, yeah, and that's going to be the second part. Yeah. When Mary gets into that latter part, I mean, I think families and spouses need to understand what, what can transpire. And I think it's important that people have a realistic idea uh, of what can happen and make provisions, for example, a most form. Now, I'll say that it's interesting that just this morning, I dealt with one of my patients that uh, I had filled out a most form with her not that long ago. And today we were where the rubber meets the road. You know, uh, this patient could be intubated and put on a ventilator. We could use some external means of improving her respirations. But she had signed off on that. So in a way, it's tough because physicians like to do everything uh, possible to have a patient survive, but here it's tempered with reality. Uh, this patient had made their decision about what they wanted, and so we're obliged, uh, since I helped her fill it out, uh, to accede to her wishes and keep her comfortable. So I think that type of planning is important, whether you're doing a, uh, I forget what you, healthcare, healthcare proxy, or you're doing a most form, I think it's important to think these things through because by the time you get into that situation where these questions arise, I think it's very important to have that sort of thought out. I think the worst situation I see is if we have a patient come into the emergency room unconscious, let's say of a certain age, uh, let's say older than I am, and I'm going to be 75, uh, and they don't have some pre-information, and you're calling Uncle Billy, who is on the other side of the country, hasn't seen his aunt for 50 years, and people are making decisions about this patient without really knowing what the patient's wishes are. And I think it's extremely important to, to make out these, either fill out the most forms or the power of attorney forms or whatever, so that you make your wishes known so that you don't get into a situation where people are doing things to you that you would not have wanted to have happen. You know, whether it's a question of uh, forced nutrition, IV fluid, intubation, even resuscitation. Uh, I think that these are all questions that can be answered before the day arrives. Uh, I think it's possible that these things can change, but you are the one that should be making the changes. Uh, I think it's, I would involve 
uh, your loved ones in this decision so that they understand that it's your decision. Um, my wife disagrees with what I've signed up for, but that's uh, what you'll have to deal with. I think it's, it, it will ease some of your concerns. Most people were, don't worry as much about dying as being intubated, being on a machine, being force fed, that's frightening and it is frightening. But I think you can settle those questions, settle those problems well before the, when, when Mary's still in the green phase, she can really start addressing these issues. When she gets into the red phase, then I think you, you go to a most form and you can be extremely clear. I mean, the first time I filled out a most form with a patient, it took me a while to figure out what they were really talking about. And I think it's important that you sit down with your physician, with your nurse practitioner, whatever, and say, well, what does this really mean? Because it's not all that clear. What does it mean to not resuscitate? What does it mean to, to ventilate? Uh, and it, it's got more questions on there that I don't think really make a lot of sense. Uh, because if you don't want to be resuscitated, you don't have to worry about being intubated. Uh, but I think you make that stuff clear ahead of time uh, because it makes it a whole lot easier for you because you know that you've signed that and you've filled it out and you know you're not going to, you know, in the case you don't want to be resuscitated, you're not going to end up on a machine. Uh, I think it's important to consider those things ahead of time. I think your family should be aware of it uh, because once that most form comes in with you, that's what we're going to do. Okay, uh, there is some room for weaseling around if you have a, a healthcare proxy, but I mean, if it's clear to them, then they will fulfill it. Those are the things I think about. I, you know, we want to have Mary really get out to where the warranty runs out. Okay, we want her to get out to the end of that warranty, and we want her to be productive. We want her to be happy, and I'll do the, my damnedest to keep her healthy. You know, whether that means, as mentioned, involving a variety of the social service, elder affairs, uh, PASCON, uh, hospice, all of those groups are available and can be involved. You know, you don't have to be dying immediately to be helped by PASCON. And I think it's important to avail yourself of these services. Uh, and I think it's incumbent on your physician, you know, if he, doesn't he or she doesn't bring it up, that you ask, well, should I be doing this? Should I be thinking about this? You know, I'm uh, getting a little long in the tooth, and what, what would I need to have help at home? Whether I need the elevators to go up and down the stairs, those types of things should be addressed, and they should come up with, through your physician, through uh, people that have expertise in this. But the physician isn't gonna go put the elevator in, but the physician knows the people to call to help you get the elevator in. Um, and then as medical examiner, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Levy is gonna be back when we talk about that last, that last segment. I'm gonna take all questions at the end, if that's okay. So, so and, and by the way, one of the, I think one of the things that, that the doctor mentioned was just the, a really a crucial piece, this notion of just having, especially if you're married, but even if you're younger, having that broader conversation with your kids, like when they're coming through for Thanksgiving or whatever. I know I talked to my oldest daughter um, recently because the kids come home for Christmas, right? So I got one in D.C. I have one in, in, one in D.C. with my first grandchild. Very exciting. I have one in Austin, Texas, and I have one in uh, Colorado Springs. But I told my daughter, I said, I'm turning 70 this January. I said, so this is my Christmas present. That's all I want. I want to have this conversation, right? Because, of course, the inevitable result, you know, reaction from your kids is, oh, Dad, you look great. We don't have to talk about it. Fine. But I want to have this conversation. I want you to know if something happens, if I have a stroke or something, and I'm in this, you know, whatever state I'm in, I want you to know what I'm thinking about what I think would be a good life. Right? And I think it's really, it's really, really important. So, once again, if you're, if you're married, you've got those assets. Right? So you've got a total of a million three in assets. Um, when I say it's Mary's last chance for asset protection, once again, if, if Mary is in her 80s or 90, one of her, the little cloud over her, her head is what's going to happen if I need to go to the island home 
because the money's going to get absorbed fairly quickly, and that's true. And the, and the only way to, to protect the money and, and therefore qualify for mass health if you're at the island home is give it away and wait five years. And Mary would say, maybe saying to herself at age 90, but I don't have five years, right? But, but so you need to understand this, right? So if Mary were ending up at, at, in a nursing home, that, the cost of that nursing home, I'm, I'm going to estimate for Mary, because remember Mary's income is about $2,000 a month or about $24,000 a year, is, is, um, is really $150,000 a year, which is the nursing home cost. It's a little higher than that here, but that's about right. Minus that $24,000. That's her burn rate, the rate at which her savings are going to get exhausted if she's in the nursing home. So it's $126,000 a year, um, which means that over five years, she's going to have spent $630,000 on the, on the uh, nursing home, right? But given the fact that she's in Nantucket and therefore there's this house, and th there's still a lot of value left, right? So even if she, were in, if she went into the nursing home and, one, and her kids came to me and said, oh my God, what do we do? Ma's in the nursing home. She didn't do any planning. I'd say, well, you, what you want to do at that moment, transfer all the assets to the kids, have the kids pay the nursing home for five years, and five years and a day after, after um, that's happened, Mary's going to qualify for, um, for mass health, right? But the other thing I just kind of, I want you to, to, to remember is a, a second possibility would be to have her transfer her house out to her kids, keep her cash, because maybe she doesn't want to lose control of her cash, retain a life estate in the house, that is control of the house until she dies, and also keep whatever money she feels that she just couldn't deal with or, could, or would lose sleep over if it were gone, take the rest of the money, which is really rainy day money, and transfer it to one of, her, and transfer it to one of the kids or transfer it into trust. And then knowing that it's totally protected after five years. Because, but the most important thing I want to, I want to kind of focus on here, here is if Mary does all of those things and then two years from now has to go to a nursing home. If she's transferred all these funds out, and then two years from now she has to go to a nursing home and, and needs to be paying for it, then, then really the amount of time that she then has to spend or the amount of years she has to spend um, paying for it is only three more years. If she's, if, she, if she's transferred her funds now, two years from now she goes into a nursing home, three years after that she's going to qualify for mass health if she's transferred her money out. So, at any time, if she's transferred, if she transfers funds out, she's probably going to end up saving if it ends up that she needs an extended period of time in the nursing home. Um, in terms of setting any of that stuff up, one possibility, as I've mentioned before, is you can simply give the assets away to your kids. You can give them any amount of money anytime. For those who aren't fond of that idea because they're afraid that, that it might be trouble finding the money if they need it back, uh, people will often create a trust. They'll create an irrevocable trust, name, one of, name their most trusted child as the trustee, transfer the funds to the irrevocable trust with the kind of the implicit bargain that if they need the money, the trustee of that trust is going to be able, is going to use it for them. So during that, as Mary approaches that red zone, <laughs> we'll call it a red zone, uh, at, at closer to the end of her life, I guess I often describe it as, so it, you're the point at which death is on the horizon. You're not at the dock yet, you know, but you're like, you know, you know, it's your, when you're on the boat, right, and you can kind of see Cape, you know, the Cape, right? It's a long ways, but you can see it, right? So that's, that's in, in my friend Katie Butler's book, that's the chapter that she calls Awareness of Mortality. And once again, on the page that says, do any of these ring a bell? It's when the doctor says you have a serious illness or a terminal illness or you have stage four cancer or a vital organ of yours is slowly failing or you're in the early stages of an incurable disease, right? Lou Gehrig's, ALS, of course, of course Alzheimer's. Uh, the doctor is kind of like not wanting to give you a prognosis. How, how am I going to be in the long run? Or they're saying, ah, oh, it's pretty bad, you know? Or the doctors are using words like chronic, progressive, serious, advanced. None of the words that you really want to hear, right? Um, and the doctors want to talk about your goals of care not about how the cure is going to happen, your goals of care. So the question is, in that situation, and, I, and I, by the way, so Dr. Lepre has been kind enough to, to uh, come with, to be here in Nantucket, and I have doctors that are doing presentations with me in the other places where I'm going. I want to have Aaron talk for a few minutes about 
dealing with that part of their life. And then I want to have Dr. Lepre come back and kind of talk about it, that, the, the pieces of that, of that red stage, because there is kind of the early red stage, and then when you get really close to the dock, you know, and you need to figure things out. Aaron. Thank you. Oh. Oh, did I do it wrong? All right, there we go. All right. So luckily for Mary, she was practicing proactive aging, and she uh, hired a geriatric care manager when she was in her 70s uh, till her 90s. Um, the care manager was able to help her and Frank, and now we're focusing on her. It's the same client, but now she may have some different needs and some different goals. So um, with Mary, if she was diagnosed with a terminal illness, the Mary, the client, and the family have worked with me for a while. They trust me, and I'm able to discuss difficult topics such as the advanced directives, filling out the most form, um, making sure her wishes are clear, written down, and heard through by myself and by her family members. Um, to talking about funeral arrangements. No one really wants to talk about that, but it's easy to talk about it and get it out of the way. Um, also, I know her goal is to still age in place and die in her home. Um, so for me as her care manager, I'm still going to help her try to achieve that goal by getting the appropriate care in place, whether that's working with PASCON, getting hospice care involved. Maybe she needs a live-in at this point. Um, and maybe I need to be involved more and make sure that the family feels comfortable and I kind of act as that middle man and make sure that if the family members live in another state, I provide that communication and keep them up to date on things. And at the end of life, some of the goals may change, some of her goals may remain the same, but others definitely be can become a priority. Um, we definitely want to make sure that she feels supported, comfortable, safe, that she isn't scared during the last days of her life. Um, but we also, since I've worked with Mary for a while, I know what her likes are, what her wants are, and her needs are, and her goals. So one goal may be super simple as she wants to go to, um, she wants to watch a movie, or she would love to eat a cheese pizza one before she ends up passing away. Something simple like that is something that I can help with. I can help with very difficult and um, manage the care in that kind of process, but then we can also make sure that she gets those last wishes that are very simple, that sometimes may be pushed to the side. Um, and then at the end of the day, a lot of the clients that I work with, um, I also work very closely with their family. So even though the client has passed on, I still stay very involved with the family. I helped them get through the grieving process, make sure arrangements are all set, and sometimes, uh, oftentimes, that family member will pass away and then we'll get a new family member on board with us as a care manager. Thank you, and, Sh and Sherry's not here. I'm just, I'm just gonna mention, I remember my mother just lived on vanilla ice cream for about seven days before she died. That was a great, that, her favorite thing. It was just her favorite thing, but to kind of know some of that stuff like ahead of time is just really important. And I think, and as the doctor said, to be, to be, to be kind of getting your moles form right, but also, but also really having the conversation with the person who's going to be managing your care about how, how they want, the, how they, how you want things to be dealt with, really important. But doctor, can you just talk about that, that le well, what I'll call the last year, but from the time when you kind of know it's coming to when it comes? Well, I'm really going to be talking about all of you because I'm not going to come to this. Uh, oh, every once in a while. I keep telling my clients, you know, you may be the lucky one that it doesn't happen to, but always have a plan B. I think it's important to have discussions uh, with your physician, nurse practitioner, uh, about what your prognosis is when you sort of going from that green to the red side. Uh, I think it is, I have been in situations where I have looked into the crystal ball and the crystal ball has been wrong, uh, but I think it's important that patients should understand some of the gravity of the situations they're facing. It's, we're all going to die. The idea is someone may die, but the only thing I can offer to patients is tell them that I will be there and that I will make sure they're comfortable. Um, those are the, the two things I can say. I 
can't resurrect or roll back the stone, but I can do those two things and I should fulfill those. I can also make sure that the patient's involved with hospice or with PASCON. PASCON is probably more active out here. Diane Bean, some of you have may, may know, uh, was very involved in a 200 person hospice down in Virginia. And before that, I actually hired her. She worked for me for six years. Uh, so the, these resources are there, and the thing is to get them involved earlier because there's no reason to get hospice involved on your last day because hospice and PASCON can do things to help you. So I would, if your physician doesn't bring it up, I'd bring it up. Say, well, what about hospice? What about PASCON? How can I get help? And your physician should be responsible for calling them up and getting them involved because that can be a big help. But don't wait. You, you, if, you, if you wait too late, it's not helpful. It's not helpful. It can be very helpful. They can help you. They can keep you at home. They can keep you comfortable. Those are the goals. I mean, I was working with Diane with a patient this summer, lived out on Cliff Road, and she came up here from Washington, and she wasn't going to go back home. She wasn't going to make it back home. But we were able to get involved with her to make sure she had the appropriate medications, to deal with her family, to talk to her family so that they understood what was going to happen, because they were a bit unrealistic. When the patient came into my office the first time, uh, she had a totally different idea of what stage of the end of life she was in. She, had, she was well into the red, unfortunately. But we're able to keep her comfortable, we're able to keep her home, and that's really all any of us want. Uh, you know, occasionally the hospital is the, is the, the place to do it, but it's, it's, I think, the best if we're able to manage it at home. Uh, and I think you need help. Uh, people don't ask for help soon enough. I mean, I went through it with my mother. Uh, my dad was a surgeon, and he was trying to take care of her at home without any help. And one day I mentioned it to him, and I said, you know, Dad, this really isn't working. Uh, he got upset with me and cut me out of the will, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but I think it's important that you get people in that can view this whole situation from the outside. They aren't torn up on the inside trying to take care of you uh, in this, when you're in the red phase. It's, it's extremely difficult. It's fraught with all kinds of issues when you have to have this split role of a nurse and also as a relative or a spouse or a mother or whatever. You need, you need help so that you can do the things you should be doing as the relative and not doing the things that a nurse or an aide can do for you. Uh, so those are the things that I think are important. If we're not keeping patients comfortable when they're dying, then we're not doing our job. Uh, it is important. There's all kinds of ways that we can help people so that they are comfortable, and that's the one thing we can do. Uh, we can't resurrect people, but we can keep them comfortable, and we're all going to end up there sooner or later. Uh, and I would just, I mentioned PASCON, I mentioned hospice. PASCON is really based here. Hospice is coming over from the, the VNA, Cape Cod VNA. So that's uh, what I see from a, a medical perspective. Uh, get, a, get an understanding of where you are in this process. Even if you don't want to know the particulars, because not everybody wants to know the particulars, but just understand that, you know, have, ask your doctor, what's, what's going on? Am I going to die? Am I going to die soon? Is there something I should be doing is there, is there something else that we could try, or should we try? Uh, I have a patient of mine that's being operated on for cancer of the pancreas, which has spread, and I, I am horrified at it, and I've told the family I think it's a big mistake, but then people make bad decisions in those, those times. 
So those are the things I think a physician can do. We can keep you comfortable, you know, either at home or in the hospital, and you can be with your family, and you can be taken care of, and your family doesn't have to take care of you. Thank you, Don. But so I have a seat, but then I have a tri I have yeah. a trivia question because I, sure. I had seen I had seen the statistic, which is actually once again in my friend, and I keep calling her my friend. I feel like I've read the book so many times. Katie Buckler's book, when she points out, when she says that you know, eighty percent of people want to die at home. About 20% or 25% of people die at home. Everybody else dies, typically in the nursing home or in the hospital. And I remember saying that to my friend, uh, Sandy Cordobi, who is, she's the, the Erin Kopecky in Martha's Vineyard. She grew up in Martha's Vineyard. She is the geriatric care manager. I said, have you ever, how many deaths have you been participating? She's maybe 350, you know, it's just kind of part of the job. But she said, you know, I told her that statistic. She says, that's not true here. She said, she said, most people here, or a lot of people here, die at home. So I was wondering if that, in that so you see a lot of people die. It, 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 in, in broad numbers, would you, can you give me a percentage? You know, what percentage of people here typically die at home versus dying in the hospital or the island home? I think more die at home. Because I really? think we have, I mean, with Charlene Thurston, with, when she started hospice, that was the whole idea. Uh, when Diane Bean uh, took over afterwards. I mean, that's really their goal. And we've accomplished it. You know, there were certain circumstances where the hospitals needed, but that is, you have nurses coming out, they can administer medications, they can keep you comfortable, and there's no reason to be in the hospital. There's no reason. And by uh, the way, Diane was gonna, I had asked Diane to come, but she was, she's off yeah. island day, she, she couldn't make it. Yeah. But that's an incredible, I often say it here, you know, I come here, I'm always amazed by the specialness of the island, you know, and people don't realize it when they're here. But that's an incredible mm. difference from the, from the mainland and in terms even, of the percentages of people who are able, because you've got this mm. infrastructure, right? And even if it's in the hospital, I mean, a, a recent <sighs> example, uh, Diane had been involved with this family, and the patient came into the hospital, and we were in end times and but she got the whole family in she got everybody involved everybody was in there they didn't have to take care of the patient they could just be there for the patient she called around to get the appropriate minister i mean she did all of these things and sometimes people end up in the hospital but it doesn't mean it's a it's a failure of the system it just happens sometimes it happens there but you can make it not hospitalized. It doesn't have to be hospitalized. You know, with bells ringing and noise and all of that, it can be playing music and having your family there. Right, we, and so, so two, two things. First, going back to that and what, do, the, what Dr. Levery said earlier, the, one of the main reasons why you want these other people to be involved, the errands or the other folks of this world, is so that you can be the spouse, so that you, or so that your kids can be the kids. They don't want to be the nurse at that point, you know? They don't want to be having to do all this stuff. I was talking to this wonderful geriatric care manager that I work a lot with back home. Um, and she was, she, we were going to this meeting and she said, I just have to stop and get, I just have to stop at the, at the, at the supermarket and get some toilet paper. I said, you have to stop. I promised this lady, you know, and she's in her last few weeks, but I promised her we'd never run out of toilet paper. So I gotta go get this. But you know, you don't want your daughter to have to do that, right? You want your daughter in the last few weeks of your life to be your daughter, right? And to just kind of like be there. That's really, that's really, that's really important. That's really important. So okay, so I'm gonna do a little bit of law, just a little bit. Um, doctor got it. The, the, and when you're in the red, in that red zone, you may be wanting to revise your MOLS form, right? Because you may be, want, you may be saying, for example, one of the little boxes on the MOLS form is, do not hospitalize me. So if the EMT shows up at the door, and, 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 but, he, but what he's supposed to do, this, the standard operating procedure, you know, so that he won't get sued, is he's supposed to pick you up and get you in the ambulance and get you to the hospital, unless the MOLS form is on the refrigerator and it says, do not hospitalize. So if you want to die at home, then you want to die at home. That means you got to tell the EMT that you want to yes. die at home, and then they'll pick you up and they'll put you in your bed, right? So you want to, may want to revise your MOLS form. You want to talk to your proxy, because you want it to be clear to your proxy what you, you know, what you want. You may be wanting to write it down so that as going back to what something that Dr. Lepre said earlier, 
so that, that your proxy, the lucky one who is around here, doesn't have to be dealing with the brother in San Francisco who's all of a sudden saying, oh, why, you know, you should be, <laughs> you should be doing that. We gotta blah, 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 you know. So look, this is what dad wanted. This is what Ma wanted, you know, and it's because it, you know, and it, and he didn't just tell me; it's written down. So it's really helping your it's really helping your proxy. Uh, dealing with your assets. Remember, as I've said before, you can just give it all away. If you give everything away before you die, then no one has to go through probate. It often and it can substantially reduce your estate tax because if you have nothing when you die. There will be no estate tax. In Massachusetts, there is no gift tax. And if you're at zero when you die, there's no estate tax, right? Um, you, wanna, you maybe want to structure things so that, it, so that when you die, your kids don't have to go through a lot of hassles with this. I was just talking to a lady actually at noon because um, they're, they're doing some estate planning around this because she just went through this with her mother and her mother died. She said it was so great. Everything was in a trust. I'm the successor trustee. Everything got distributed right away. We didn't have to talk to the lawyers. Oh, no, I, you know, nothing wrong with lawyers, you know, but you didn't have to talk to the lawyers, you know, it was really quick. So, so you may, Mary may be wanting to do that stuff. And then you have to read that book. You have to read that book. And I'm gonna show you the book afterwards, right? Um, and remember, um, if, if you, you think this is just a terrific presentation, but we went too fast, you can always watch it again on Frank and Mary's YouTube channel. And, or you can get it on, you can download it from Nantucket Cable TV. Any questions? Questions? What does the acronym MOLST stand for? MOLST, Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. The national term for it is POLST, and I have no idea what the P stands well, for. I don't know. But it's something, Orders for Life, Sus for, for, for order. life Sustaining Treatment. So it's basically a, and it's got two pages, and one page, this is the one that you, it's really important to be the front on the refrigerator, is kind of emergency stuff. I have stopped breathing. Don't make me try to breathe again. My heart has stopped. Don't try to get it going again. I remember the statistic I heard from another geriatric, or geriatrician, um, that if you're, I think it's 70, if you're over 70 and, 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 and they try resuscitation, your likelihood of still being alive after 30 days is 5%. Your likelihood of being resuscitated is like 25%, but not for long, you know, you're gonna die. And then in the meantime, you've gone through this incredibly painful thing, right? They're pressing through your ribs, probably breaking them. It's awful. So, you know, we, you know revise the moles form. Questions from anybody? Uh, yes, ma'am. Someone said that uh, the moles is a state document, and if you were traveling and happen to die, in another state or need uh, an ambulance or need help, uh, that that most document isn't uh, legal. It is my understanding that that is correct. The question was, is are most documents valid across borders? And the answer is no. Oftentimes people will honor them anyway, even though they're not supposed to, right? But actually there's, there's been a lot of national dialogue about how to deal with that. Because all of all, because state licensure is, and all of these folks are regulated by the state. And really, what the what the what the most form is, it it looks like it's it's a set of instructions from you, but it's really not. It's an, a set of instructions from your doctor. Your doctor has to sign the form. You assent to it. And what he's doing, really, he or she, is he's basically he's basically giving medical orders to the people down the food chain, to the EMT or to the nurse or to the whatever, saying. Contrary to what you're supposed to do, according to the kind of general rules of what you're supposed to do, this is what you're going to do. You should do in this case because this is what the patient really wants, right? And those rules vary by state, so they they they, they and 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 in states they're very sensitive to this. You know, people are about to die. You know, you're wor you're worried because you're about to die. They're all worried about liability. You know, what happens if we do something wrong? So they hate to get that part wrong. Yes, ma'am. I was going to ask. At what point are you going to put that most thing up on the, I, I mean, it, it occurs to me that one could just fall and be unconscious, but you're not really dying. So the people come and they see that most thing up there and they don't know what to do because they think they could save you. I mean, they're not, they're just technicians.
And the question is, when do you put it up on the refrigerator? And the answer is, that's a great question. Because, because as the doctor said, once the, once the form is there, right, the, the people down the food chain are obliged to, to, to manage that form. So what you really want to do is, you want to make sure if it's up there, but then you just fall, that your husband takes it down really quick before the EMT gets there. Well, I mean, I think if you've got, if you've fallen and you've got a broken hip, okay, that, 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 that's not a question. I mean, the, the most form is really directed towards people that are in extremis. That's really what it is. It's people that are actively dying or dead. And How do these people know that? When they come well, because if you don't have a pulse and you're not breathing, okay. you're dead. Yeah, dead. Yeah. Uh, and if, the most you've got a, you know, if you're on the floor with a broken hip, you got a broken hip, but you're still pretty feisty. Right, because the mean, most form only covers these kinds yeah. of extreme things. If my heart stopped, don't yeah. start it. If I, you know, not, if I've got a broken hip, just leave me where I am. I mean, that gets to the, yeah. that gets to the hospital thing, although presumably if you've got a broken hip, that means you're awake and you're saying, I'm going, because you, you can always overrule it. Mm. And by the way, the person you've named as your proxy can over, overrule it, mm. right? Because your proxy always has the power, although I was told, this is an interesting thing. This is the classic, the classic you know, case on this stuff is so that, so that you're on the floor and your husband's there and the, and the EMTs come in, right? And the MOLS form says, do not hospitalize, right? And you're out and you're on the floor. And your husband says, wait a minute, I'm the proxy. I'm overruling that. I want you to hospitalize her, right? What the EMT is supposed to do in that case is leave you on the floor because the proxy only comes, is only legally is activated once your doctor has said that you can't make a medical decision. And in that situation, your doctor hasn't said that yet. So the EMT is supposed to abide by the, by the, uh, the most one. Little known but interesting fact. Uh, other, other questions? If not, thank you very, very much well, for coming. Oh, also, I'm sorry, doctor. Make sure doctor. that your doctor or nurse practitioner has your, a copy of your MOLS form or uh, advanced directive scanned into your chart because we have gone around this at medical staff meeting and that can be scanned into your chart because the next thing is if the MOLS form has slipped behind whatever else you got in the refrigerator. <laughs> uh, your daughter's it's, picture. It's right? very no, important the new that grandchild. <laughs> at the hospital we're able to look on your chart because that's one of the first things to come up on the chart and will give us further information about what your wishes are. I mean, none of us, I don't think anybody here would like to go through some of the things that, that happen to people that come in that don't have this information there and full resuscitative efforts are done and it's, it's not anything anybody would want, quite frankly. But as, you, but as you've said, doctor, better to have that conversation yeah. when you're on the, on, the, on the early side of the red zone than at the end, because at that thing, point, everybody's emotions are high, things are swirling around, and the tendency is gonna be to say, do everything you can. But there's a point at which, yeah. you know, you as Mary probably said at one point, don't do everything you can. You know, I'm okay. most, most of my clients, most of your patients, mm. right? You get to this point in your lives, and it's like, you're okay. I'm okay with this. I'm okay with the fact that I'm going to die. I don't want a lot of pain mm. from, my, from my own personal thing. I don't want a lot of nausea, right? I'm okay with this. I mean, but, 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 that's, but that's why you need to have the conversation with your kids too. Because they need, I mean, there's all that guilt around that, right? And that lets your kids be your kids. So they're not trying to figure this out. They're just, you know, the rules are all there, okay? The yes, Jane. The most take the place of what used to be, I know my mom, I don't know if it was in her health direct or health proxy or she had done a tape or DNR. She, yes. She didn't want well, she didn't want to be she was on a she had a stroke and she ended up on a life support and she didn't want to live on life support. So within twenty four hours we it was turned off and that was that and no there was no question. So is that now on the most form? So the so you're saying that you're, in your mother's case, and was this in Massachusetts? Well, she lived in Massachusetts, but it happened in Washington State. Uh, but yeah. but during your mother's case, she had written she had written someplace that that she that she didn't want to be on these ongoing life support, and I think that's the second page mm. of the Moles form, okay, that's right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like the back page. But it's important that I mean, as you said, it 
it is not particularly legal in another state, but I suspect that if you produced a most form, it would be, it would, an EMT would probably not override it, even if it was Connecticut or Rhode Island. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to just mention one other thing. I learned, I never knew this stuff, but I happen to be, you know, so I'm in this big law firm. So next to me is a lawyer who does nothing but healthcare work doing hospitals. We represent UMass. Actually, we represent the system. We do all the med mal defense for these folks. So, so, um, so he had just given me this piece, I said, this piece of trivia because I was talking about, so is it true that if you don't have a healthcare proxy that, and you're in the hospital, that somebody go, go go, has to go get a guardian appointed? And he said, well, actually, if, the, if it's an emergent situation, what the hell is this? I, I assume this means emergency. In, like an emergent situation, the doctor has the right on his own to tr guess basically, and to say, this is how I think this person should be treated. But in that situation, one of the things he mentioned was, that's where it's sometimes useful. I, I, I've always, I've said here before, living wills aren't legally binding in Massachusetts. You can't have a set of instructions regarding how you're going to, you want to be cared for, except for the moles mm -hmm. form, right, that's legally binding. However, as he pointed out, if you've done that kind of set of, this is what's important to me, and you've gone to the doctor or the hospital and had to put in your medical record, and this situation occurs, the doctor's gonna read that and it's gonna help inform the doctor. And this is especially important because there, there is a set of people who just don't have anybody, they don't have any family or somebody they can trust to be their proxy. And they find themselves being helpless because they can't name a proxy. And now I can so say to them, so write something down, get it in the medical record, it's gonna help your doctor figure it out. With that, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Can I have a quick round of applause for my friends, Aaron Kopecki and Roger?